right, hello everybody. My name is Bo Barron. I'm a CCM instructor and I'm also the broker owner of Barron Commercial Group. I wanna welcome you to today's webinar, which is leveraging research to identify profitable CRE sectors. We're happy to share this webinar with everyone in the industry today as part of our 2021 CCIM Global Conference. For CCIM Institute members, this is just one of many member benefits that are designed to help you adapt and thrive in the ever-changing commercial real estate industry. Joining us today is Victor Kalinog, PhD, Head of CRE Economics for Moody's Analytics in Reese. I want to, uh, to welcome him, but also please feel free to ask your questions throughout this interview and webinar using uh, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll be answering as many of those as we can get to at the end of the session. And if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to ask for help with that. The recording and accompanying presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. So Victor, my friend, Thanks for joining us today. I'm excited oh, about this conversation. Hey, Bo, thanks for having me and uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Is that still a yep. thing? We tune in to webinars? Man, we are today. So it's, it's going to work today. I'm actually in Chicago right now in the CCIM global headquarters, and I'm here teaching a 102 class. And one thing I wanted to ask you as we started this interview is in this class right over there, we've got 25 year old industrial developers and we've got former NFL players. It's a really interesting class, but we're using your data in the class. We're using Reese reports. We're using Moody, uh, Moody's analytics. Um, and I trust it because somebody told me to, hey, this is good data and I believed it. But I do wonder, and I've had this question before, like how do you get this information? Yeah, I, Where does I think it come that from? Yeah, that I think that's a great conversation to have because you're always want to going to scratch underneath what the preliminary numbers mean, right? And I always like using the word preliminary. Think about all the publicly released data from the U.S. government that move markets, things like the jobs report every first Friday of the month. Those things actually change and or are re-estimated over time. And so we're going to want to be pretty intelligent about where this data is coming from and how we want to interpret it so that we can truly frame our insights based on where opportunities are and where risks might be. That's a long-winded way of saying scratch underneath the surface of all of this data that you're receiving, whether it's from the U.S. government or from Moody's or from Reese. So the stuff that comes to you guys from the Reese side is the product of about 40 plus years of experience in the industry because Reese was founded in 1980 by founders Lloyd Linford and John Garfield. And back in the day, we were all writing these reports. Actually, they were working with Peter Corpax, who eventually like ended up creating the PWC report, which is now the ULI annual thing, right? They're writing all these market level reports that weren't that differentiated over what local brokers could generate. And so the market demand appeared to be can we have a national level coverage of the typical five or five food groups, main property types where folks are usually interested in and where they invest so that we can compare across markets and really have a common nomenclature, rents, vacancies, expenses. How do you estimate NOIs? Really, you divide NOI by the cap rate. Don't we have discounted cash flow analysis these days? Don't you I don't want to analyze 10 years of uh, financial? So, so things have evolved over time, but really it rests on the foundation of let's collect good property level data over time that we can compare across markets so that we can actually go and say, you know what, Chicago is doing better than Philadelphia because the vacancy rate is this. Uh, by the way, in this day and age, given how things have changed, I think a lot of people are pretty disappointed when they can't get information, data, and charts over Google, right? Is that not true? Oh, yeah. Aren't oh, you absolutely. upset, Bo, when you're like, gosh, you know, I want to look up the bus schedule. And I, I'm kind of frustrated if I can't like do a quick Google or internet search and it doesn't pop up right away. Right. Yeah. If you don't have it in five seconds, there is a level of frustration. And absolutely. We, we all want everything pretty real time. 
And actually, Bill Gates wrote a lovely book in the early 90s called The Road Ahead. He, he predicted this exactly even before we were on the internet. We know the internet has arrived once we start getting frustrated about not finding restaurant menus for lunch or the bus schedule or your plane fare, like right, right at the tip of your, of your fingers. Yeah. However, I do believe that for quality data on which you can base analytics, you're gonna wanna have to dig deeper and make sure that it's curated by folks who can speak the same language as you, right? Because the commoditized data that's out there, you absolutely shouldn't pay for it, right? You can get it on Google, great. But that's right. why don't you show a large lender, like the biggest banks in the world, in the US, right? Your 40 year time series for cap rates. So that we can make a judgment about way. I don't think you can Google that very easily, right? No, and so you can't. I think over time, because of the theme of this conversation, leveraging research, we want to make sure that you have options, both in the stuff that you can get for free and very quickly on the internet, uh, both in the stuff that you should probably be sourcing locally and the stuff that the Moody's of this world can provide you, because I do think they do serve and illuminate different facets of this elephant that we're all trying to figure out. Does that make sense? It does. So let me ask you about this elephant. Elephant, in general, what's your take on the overall economic growth in the Q, in Q4 of this year? Like, what are, what are we looking at for the rest of this year and next year? Okay, so- And, and I'm interested to see, if your opinion, your thoughts have changed since oh, yeah. the beginning of the year. We started this year off pretty optimistic with a bang, literally. Once you start projecting GDP growth rates of six, five, six, seven, six, eight, right? Off of a $21 trillion economy that grew on average by 2.1% in the last decade of expansion, okay? Six, seven is the strongest number we have seen since 1984 to be followed in 2022 by a 5.1, five, 5.2 five, growth rate. Man, those two years, you're going to have to look back to the 1970s before many of us were born. No, 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 I'm just kidding. I was, I was already alive when, in the 1970s. But it's going to be growth and economic activity that we have not seen in 40 to 50 years. That was certainly the prognosis through the summer. And you know what was going on? So I'm going to alternate between two sources of data and research, right? One, the official numbers that often come with a lag from the government, GDP, economic activity, that takes time to collect. We're a very big economy. And number two, higher frequency data. That's what's very sexy. That's what makes the news. That's what tends to get refreshed on a daily and sometimes hourly basis. And those are typically indicators of where things are going, right? So I'm going to toggle between those two. Number one, I said that we were pretty optimistic this year and the higher frequency data actually justified it. People were returning to airports. There was confidence building. We were back up to 75 to 80% of pre-COVID levels in terms of airport traffic. The TSA actually does a good job refreshing on a daily basis how much people are being screened across the nation. And so we can make those, I wrote an API poll to just take a look at that TSA data. Then, because I was interested to see, okay, but that might be the summer, right? That might be Bo, like getting all oh, cabin fever because he's been confined through lockdown and now we're all flying. And so it's interesting how it all maps into opportunities in commercial real estate, hotel in particular. Man, hotel took a beating in COVID, yeah. right? It was terrible. Occupancies oh, was were, were down to 10, 20% in some markets. Whereas you need to be at 60 to 65% to break even, right? Well, we were back to over 60% occupancies by the second quarter of this year. Talk about being back in a big way. You've had some airports at Bozeman, Montana was at 130% of 2019 levels. Some airports were back in a big way. That's your higher frequency data. On the other hand, you had airports like LA and so on and so forth and other large markets, which were still at 50 to 60% of pre-COVID levels. So where does this all lead us in terms of opportunities and our outlook for the year? Off to a big start through the summer, and then in the third or fourth quarters, concerns about the Delta variant and the emerging concerns about supply chain disruptions and issues really put a damper on our most optimistic of assessments. So from 6-7, right? I cited that number for 2021. Mm -hmm. We are now down to around 5758 for the rest of the year. 
or sorry, for, for the for the year as a whole, which means the, the latter half of the year, because we were pulling about 6365 through the second quarter. Really, I mean, we made those numbers, but now we're expecting a pretty significant slowdown. And Bo, let me tell you, for the fourth quarter, our early higher frequency indicators are suggesting that we might be down to one to two percent, right? Talk about a come down, six, seven percent, fourth quarter down to one to two percent. That's the effect of a general pullback in consumer confidence, though retail sales are bumping up, right? And this just general uncertainty of, I'm going to capture it this way, right, Bo? Where are you again in Chicago? I'm in Chicago today, yes. You're in the CCIM's offices, right? I am. What does it feel like? What's the physical occupancy like? It's a bunch of people there. Uh, no, no, there are, are a few people here. The so majority of the people on this floor is the course that we're having, that we're teaching. Yeah, so I mean, think about that, right? We all expected that we'll likely be going back to work, even from a preliminary, by September. And that's just not happening. Now, later on, we're going to talk about different property types, like well, what about student housing? Aren't colleges and universities all back? Aren't parents kind of happy now that they don't have to live with their teenagers day in and day out as they did during lockdown? We're going to talk about that later. But in general, that's how our outlook changed. Six, seven, around five, seven, five, eight might be scaled down once again. And that doesn't sound like much. That sounds like Victor, you know, five, seven is still the highest GDP growth we will, we will have seen since 1984. But one percentage point is half the economy of Hong Kong right? For the US. That's big. <laughs> we just basically said, we're scaling down about $200 billion of economic activity. Does that make sense? It, it does. Yep. But here's what I just heard you say. We started off with a lot of optimism. There's still some pieces of data coming in that are telling us that, that we're trending up. We're Absolutely. good things ahead. Yep. But we're also dialing things down because of the Delta variant. And so which is it? Are you optimistic about next year? Uh, so in, in general, yeah, that's a great question. In general, I'm not projecting five plus percent economic growth rate next year, right? I'm projecting four, three, four, four, might be down to four. But just to give you some perspective, is four a bad number for the U.S. economy? Absolutely sounds, not, right? We were growing <laughs> We were growing in the low fours in the late 90s when the tech boom was going on, right? It's a big economy. And by and large, economist eggheads like myself have concluded, maybe there's one number that you guys need. There's a lot of numbers we're going to be spouting throughout this session. But there's one number that you guys need to remember from this re economic research in general. It's this. The long-term growth potential of the U.S. economy is around 2%. Okay? So steady state, if demand and supply matched up, right? Not demand like wildfire as we're experiencing today because we locked the economy down and we're revving back up. Not that. Steady state, the U.S. economy at $21 trillion really only has a runway of about 2% inflation adjusted every year. So 4%, that's double your long-term potential, right? Mm -hmm. I'm still yeah, pretty, can... In that sense, I'm still pretty optimistic, Bo. Okay. So let me ask you this. For CRE, for commercial real estate, what do you see as the biggest risk moving into 2022 so, for commercial real estate? Of course, we're, we're, we're going to, I'm an economist, so I'm going to fence it, right? We're going to talk about risk first, but then I'm going to show you why that's the other side of a blade of opportunity, right? I think one of the biggest risks for CRE right now is an unexpected spike in interest rates whether it's because the Fed decides that they need to raise interest rates sooner or the market decides that the Fed's going to do something of that ilk and 10-year treasuries, which are typically our risk-free benchmark for commercial real estate, spikes. And by that, I mean right now our project... I know these are all vague stuff that you typically hear on CNBC, right? So I'm going to give you actual numbers, right? For the listeners here. I just gave you 2% growth rate. That's what you need to remember, right? But right now, our 10-year treasuries are still pretty low, right? In the twos, they're about or even below that. We're currently forecasting that it's going to gradually rise because of the Fed's current trajectory and where we see the economy going and all that, right? 
to break 3% by the end of 2023. Okay? So, Bo, let me, uh, let me ask you. If your risk-free rate is going from where it is right now to just slightly above 3% at the end of you know, two years from now, does that worry you? No. Seems pretty gradual. Seems pretty manageable. If you're trying to manage pricing and deals, you'd be like, okay, I can take. But what if your 10-year treasuries hit 4%? next quarter, which is two and a half months from now, right? That we, that we would notice. That I think is yep. going to compress cap rate spreads quite a bit when we've gotten used to 10, 12 years of declining cap rates, right? In which case, I think we're going to have to seriously think about CR evaluation. And no, that's the risk, right? On the opportunity side, we might finally have some of those quote unquote revalued or repriced assets that we never really got during this downturn, right? Aside from a handful of hotel and retail properties. So we're gonna talk about that later, but I do think the biggest risk to CRE right now is an unexpected spike in interest rates, including the Fed's overnight borrowing, as well as our 10 year risk-free. Okay, when I asked that question, I thought you were gonna say inflation. Like that's what I thought. You're reading me. Is there anything that people aren't talking about risk wise? Well, that worth we, mentioning? That, that's a great point, Bo, actually, because let's talk about inflation real quick. What would prompt the Fed to do exactly what I said to raise interest rates faster than they were planning to do? It is inflation, right? And yet, how mm -hmm. should we think about inflation given everything that's going on? I'm an economist, so unfortunately, guys, come on. It's been 15 minutes, and I haven't said demand and supply, so give me some credit. But now I am going to say it, right? Because demand, in other words, GDP growth and so on, aggregate demand is so strong in the high fives, low sixes, right? And supply, you've heard all of these news articles, uh, supply chain issues and people not being, oh, God, place your order for Christmas now. They might be out of stock online for that gift that you wanted to buy for your nephew, right? Supply chain, constrained supply, high demand equals higher prices, right? That's inflation. That's, that's not a surprise. You step on the gas and then your rear wheels aren't moving as quickly, you're going to burn through those tires. Inflation is that burning of tires in a car that's supposed to go at 2% speed. We're making it go at 6%, right? That's my analogy for you. So that's what's driving it. I am fairly worried. I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about inflation. I believe it is a simmering pot. I don't think it's headed to the boiling point just yet. I know you're going to get tired of my analogies by the time this conversation is over. But let me tell you, like, let me just bring it back home. Look at where I am. I hope you know, folks are seeing this video, right? Gosh, I hope, you, I hope you're seeing this video because Bo and I shaved for you, right? That's right. I'm in my basement office, okay? My lovely wife carved this out for me before Thanksgiving, and clearly, she has a better forecasting model than I do because shortly after Thanksgiving, lumber prices spiked three, four, five X, right? You remember this? Oh, I remember. And then it was in the news. Our contractor literally texted me and said, I don't know how you predicted it, but man, if you like had this basement made today, this was around March or April, it had cost you twice more. I'd be like, yeah, but you're a contractor. You're always going to jack me. But in any case, it was real. And yet, look, it was transitory, wasn't it? Lumber futures it have fallen, right? And so, you know, that's then the inflation debate as to whether or not it should prompt an action from the Fed if it's not transitory, or if we're in the stage where we're really ramping up and inflation is not unexpected, maybe you don't raise interest rates because it's a flash. It's simmering, but not boiling. Does that make sense? So It does, but let me ask it to you this way, because I'm 44 years old. I was born in 1977. So we're millennials, dad, like everyone else. My dad, yeah, my dad has told me stories about what interest rates did because of inflation in 1980. And he was a home builder at the time. So at the time, he's looking around, he's got crews, I, I build houses. And so he transitioned from that into self-storage, which was a really good move at the time, but he did it to keep his guys employed. There's a whole generation of me's out here that have heard stories about inflation, but mm -hmm. never really had to deal with the real impact of it. Like, what should we, 
expect if we start to see four, five, six percent inflation? Well, you know, I don't think that's a hyperinflationary environment, right? These are Latin American experiences from the 1970s, post-war experiences for some countries that needed to switch currencies. It's terrible because literally your dollar today is worth like 10 cents tomorrow in a truly hyperinflationary environment. That is scary. That is truly scary. And that's when I think monetary authorities are going to be forced to use tools like things like really hard to conceptualize things like negative interest rates to stimulate investment, which should ease that boiler a little bit, right? So it's it, well, it's it's really tough. It's really it, trying to tame inflation by raising interest rates will put a break on economic activity, right? So I wanted to be precise about that. If there's high inflation right now, you know, we were trying to save the economy, right? And so we wanted to simulate stimulate activity. That's why we lowered interest rates. But now, did we lower interest rates so much that we encourage this kind of price spikes? In which case, we now have to reverse that and raise interest rates. Here's the problem, Bo. It's really hard to time when you need to take that punch bowl away when the party's going on, right? Right? Yeah, you're right. That's literally what's going on. We, sorry to use the word that like bodybuilders use, but we really like juice the economy up with this kind of interest rate policy, right? Infrastructure spending, fiscal spending, bailout packages, that's a fiscal boost as well to an economy that was ailing. And now is it time to take the punch bowl away because the party's here and maybe the party's a little too loud, right? The, the thing I'm really sure of, Bo, is this. You don't want to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And neither do oh, you I. You got that right. <laughs> you got right? that right. Because okay, you will so never do any. You, you, you're, you're never going to get it right. You're never going to get it right. The moment you raise interest rates and then an inflation fall and then a recession follows, then it's your fault, right? Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. it's it, it's yeah, a really that, really tough. It's a knife's edge. It's a really tough balance. Bo, okay, you were so about to been... mention specific sectors, so maybe we can talk about that because this is about right, CRE. Well, I had a. a a fellow instructor say to me uh, a couple of weeks ago in Louisville, Kentucky, we were there and he said, Bo, in every market, there are opportunities if you know where to look and, and how to find them, right? So where are the opportunities in general in CRE and, in, in, you know, through the pandemic, are there any asset classes that surprised you in their performance? I'll start with the obvious ones, okay? Of course, in retrospect, it's obvious. Uh, the ones that were truly resilient and the ones that are receiving a lot of capital investment right now are unsurprisingly multifamily and distribution warehouse for logistics and industrial, right? Yep. These are the two property types that were, uh, let's compare and contrast, multifamily vacancies did rise from a pre-pandemic quote-unquote level of about 4.7, 4.8%, but it didn't rise as much as we thought it would. Of course, you know, when you're projecting basic, let, let's just remember what we were, what April of 2020 was like, right? The World Bank was projecting that the U.S. economy would contract by 8%. 8% doesn't sound like much, but that is more than three times the Great Recession of 08 and 09, right? Mm -hmm. And so, Coming off of projections like that upstream, of course, here we were. Hey, Reese numbers. Bo just said these, they were good, right? Hey, who's in charge of the Reese forecast? Me, right? So we were projecting 4.7, 4.8 to go to around 6.5%, right? That's not the record high. The record high was 8, but we thought there would be distress in the multifamily side. Guess what? It topped out at 5.3%, and it was flat for earlier this year in the third quarter, Bo, and this was data we just recently released, like last week or so, it dropped by 60 basis points. So we're now at 4.7%, asking an effective rents rose by 7.5 and 7.6% in the third quarter alone. So year over year, we've got markets like Phoenix and Tacoma pulling 20 plus percent rent growth, really record stuff. In fact, 7.5 and 7.6% is the highest quarterly growth rate for rents on record in multifamily since Reese began publishing quarterly numbers in 1999. And let me ask you both for a quick history lesson. Which commercial real estate data provider was publishing quarterly data in 1999? You. No one. You got it. 
No one. No, no. we started it. Like, we started it literally because back before 1999, the CRE industry was perfectly fine with yearly trends, right? And then it became really a bit more real time. So it's it's a nice, uh, it really. And now it's like people seem to be disappointed disappointed when they can't get rent growth for October 21, 2021, year over year, right? It's it's not that real time. So you know it's 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 a multifamily doing great. Industrial, Bo, never even experienced, never even experienced anything. You know what's going on? Vacancies kept trending downwards, and rents kept rising. And we built close to 200 million square feet of industrial warehouse distribution space. And so, if you think about it, that kind of research. And by the way, how did we come up with those numbers? Right? These were building by building research. Right? You're not gonna like trust forecasts out there that can't actually break. The, like Bo, you just mentioned this, right? Every market has opportunities and risks, right? But you're probably not going to trust econometric forecasts and research to just base it off of mathematical models. As a real estate guy, you're going to go and go and say, "Yeah, really? Are you saying that you know 1.2 million square feet are going to come online in Dallas, Fort Worth for industrial? Well, show me the buildings, right? That's what you're going to ask. Oh yeah, right. And so for then you know for 18 to 24 months from a research perspective, and I love this about my job is literally we'll spit out an out of box number from our statistical models for where warehouse distribution is going, where the opportunities are, right? And what's gonna happen is it's going to be overridden by building level research that we track. We track construction activity all the way from when it's planned and proposed to when it's under construction to when it's complete. And then it becomes part of our inventory and trends, right? Because we wanna give Bo and all you real estate investors neighborhood and building specific, and then we can have a conversation about man, you're missing this 900 unit apartment complex. I know that's coming online because I know the market. And then we're going to have a conversation about, oh, that 900 unit complex is slated to be a student housing complex. So this is where we record it. This is not in multifamily. Does that make sense? And so I really wanted to bring it, it's opportunities and risks, but here's also research methodology and what I think we really need to think about in the industry when it comes to applying the numbers and the analytics. Go for it. Okay. Well, let's apply some numbers and analytics to office. You just told us, man, through the pandemic, uh, multifamily and industrial uh, did fantastic. Office did not. Uh, I've hear, I've, I'm hearing people say, man, office as a category might be dead. I'm hearing about the, this hybrid future. What does the data tell us about the office sector? So again, quick history lesson, right? Did anyone in commercial real estate investment and analytics care about physical occupancy before COVID? Or were we all running NOIs and DCFs off of economic occupancy as long as the tenant was paying, right? We That's cared an interesting about- interesting question. Right? Because all I cared about was the rents. But you all, all you cared about, you didn't care about how many people were occupying that space, right? You cared about whether the tenant was paying and was likely to, to leave, right? And so what's interesting and what, how research really changed a bit because of COVID was we started caring about physical occupancy. There are now data providers like the castles of this world that track in high frequency basis, things like ID swipes in office buildings. And so they can give you an idea by building and by market and by metro, okay, are we back to X percent occupancies? And so let me share a few comparative statistics from the latest research to tell you where people appear to be back and where it seems to be lagging. The Dallas's of this world, the Florida's of this world, back up to maybe 45 to 55% physical occupancy, okay? On average, the nation is back up to maybe 35, 40%. The New Yorks of this world, the LAs of this world, not quite yet. And one of the big drivers there, really, when you link it back up to not high frequency sexy data, but the official data on like industries and job composition, is that for a lot of these dense urban areas, my suspicion is a lot of the jobs are also amenable to being done in a hybrid fashion, mostly service industries, right? So on and so forth. And then the other factor that appears to be constraining the return to office is if you're in a market that's really, really like Chicago, where the workforce is relatively more dependent on public transport, how did you get to the office, Bo? Did you take an Uber? Did you take? 
I did take an Uber Metro. from, uh, I took an Uber from the hotel. The other instructor lives about 20, 20 miles away. He yeah. takes the train in. And yeah. he took the train. He did. Yeah. So a lot of markets, though, have apparently have workforces, and we get this from business surveys, right, who are still hesitant to hop on the train because of this, because of the Delta virus, because of all that, right? And so I think... You know, it's that push and pull where, yeah, I don't think the office is going to die. But with that said, we thought we were going to be back in the office in September. We're not quite there yet. We actually experienced a significant drop in telecommuting rates, right? So we also capture that in the census. How many people are telecommuting? Well, that's the inverse of people who aren't in the office, right? And the New York Metro, for example, fell from about 47% in February and March, about 35% by June, because people were not telecommuting, going back to the office, right? But it really flattened out since then. The latest numbers are, this isn't high frequency data, but you know, it's, I, I suspect that the, the rate of telecommuting was likely to have risen in September and October as things got colder and people just basically said, look, if I work for Apple, Google, Facebook, Moody's Corporation, like some guy in this call, right? But we're not going back to the office, at least not en masse, till 2022. And so, you so, know, decidedly uncertain when it comes to the fate of office because of those latest statistics on physical occupancy. Back to you, Bo. Okay, so if we're looking forward, it's just uncertain. I think so. Now I'm going to give you specific numbers, right? We are projecting the vacancy rate for the office sector to hit 18.6% in about a year or two. We are currently at 18.2%. So we're expecting it to continue rising, but not to That's alarming levels. I know we were quoted in The Economist once for our research. I guess they were leveraging our research. And then, of course, the headline was, Moody's expects that one-fifth of offices are going to be empty in two years. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's generally true because back then I was projecting 19.4, right? 19.4% vacancies. But then we were coming off of 18.1, 18.2%. So it is not much to climb up to 19.4. And by the way, just historically speaking, this is also how you want to take a look at research. It's not just the now, it's also the history, right? Well, what was mm -hmm. the record high for office vacancies? 19.7% in 1991. So for us to be projecting rising vacancies takes into account the uncertainty for the office sector, okay? But that doesn't mean we are projecting the death of the office sector precisely because, you know, we do think that at some point people, we will emerge from the end of this. I think hybrid is going to be here to stay in some form, but I'd, I'd be surprised if a lot of companies really go 100% hybrid en masse. Back to you, okay. Bob. Well, what about retail? So retail is was been dealing with uh, uncertainties, right? Even before COVID, we knew that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think COVID revealed a true world of have and have nots for retail. You really had neighborhood and community shopping centers that did relatively well and sustained their occupancy rates throughout COVID, primarily because they were anchored by groceries and pharmacies, which never really closed because they were perceived to be essential services, right? They were never mandated to close. Absolutely. Malls, on the other hand, had vacancy rates spike to record levels. No surprise. Whenever you saw those headlines of retailers going bankrupt or needing help, they were likely to be occupying mall space. Now, with that said, I do think that these evolutionary forces that are now forcing us, sorry about that alliteration, forces forcing, right? To think about omni-channel strategy, do you sell online or do you sell through physical? I think, I think the way to think about it too, from a research point of view, is really not that everything is migrating online, right? Bo, let me ask you, where do you buy your groceries? At the grocery store. So, like, well, my wife orders them online. She goes and drives to the parking lot. They load her car. She drops home. Like, that's oh, how we so she's groceries. discovered curbside delivery. Oh, yeah. And she's all about it. And if I end up going, it's because we need that one thing. And oh, you're, go, you're, the, you're the guy that shops with the list, don't you? I'm that absolutely. And she wrote the list, gave it to me, and I go get what you need. So, like, I'll go in the store. She never goes in the stores anymore. Got for it. Grocery shopping. She orders it online and they, they load it in the car. And, and I think that's the perfect example to show you how retail is uncertain and evolving at this time, right? It's 
All right, what do you do with fallow space? Not all fallow space is going to be, uh, not sorry, not all retail space is going to be unproductive, which is why, you know, Warby Parker, which was founded by a bunch of Wharton students that I knew personally, they used to sell eyeglasses online. Look at my eyeglasses, right? They actually convinced mm -hmm. people that you can like get fitted eyeglasses by doing this on your website. They sold a bunch of stuff. Now they went public pretty recently. Do you know how many physical stores Warby Parker now has? Give me a guess. A purely online seller of eyeglasses that created a business model from a pure e-commerce play now has how many physical stores? 10. 10? Try 145. Really? Yes. And so the nature of retail has been changing, right? A lot of these retail outlets are more like showrooms, which is why Apple sells a bunch of stuff online. And yet they have Apple stores that tend to be preferred oh, yeah. anchor tenants, by the way, because of just all the foot traffic that they can bring. My suspicion is- Stand in line just to get in one of those things. Well, exactly. And I'm like, okay, then how come retail is that? I don't think retail space is dying. I do think that it is in the middle of a really painful evolution, right? And the properties and space that- are flexible and that can allow and can attract tenants and people. So for the items that are still, did you know, Boa, here's a statistic for research, right? 97% of groceries are still bought in stores. They are. 3% sustains the business of firms like Fresh Direct, right? However, if I order bananas, I want to like eat it like when I get home. Do you know what happens when you wait two days and they ship you bananas? They ship it green right? You know, yep. well, they ship it green so that it doesn't get beat up as much, right? But when I open that box and I see green bananas, do you know how disappointed I am? I'm very disappointed. Your wife, your wife will get curbside delivery of yellow bananas. Well, won't, won't she? Absolutely. And so I think yep. re retailers really need to think about this opportunity carefully. I think there are absolutely opportunities in what's called omni-channel strategy, just like Warby. It's not about e-commerce versus physical stores. It's about channel control for both. If you think retail is di retail space is dying, why did Amazon buy Whole Foods? Oh, yeah. Yep. Right? So well, there, that, that's, move, yeah, go ahead. For the sake of time, let me move on and ask you an industrial question. Yeah. Uh, because we are starting to get some questions in and I want to make sure that we save some time for there. But industrial is kind of in the darling of the pandemic. Uh, we actually use a metric, uh, in our 102 class, there's actually a question that the students have to answer. And the metric in the question is for every $1 of e-commerce sales, there's a demand for 1.2 square feet of warehouse distribution space. Is that a good metric? It's actually not a bad metric. Uh, the folks who have led the way for a lot of this research is actually not surprisingly, the pro logists of this world, right? So, you know, if you're wondering where some of those metrics have come from, it's because pro logists was a big player in distribution and where some logistics space have quantified, hey, in some of these markets where there's transition happening, then sure, this is the amount of industrial space we need. And they've also done incredible research when it comes to trying to quantify how much retail space might be converted to industrial, right? Because the question that you're asking right now is those in-betweens. Like, hey, if, re if malls are going fallow, why don't we convert them to industrial space? And it's an interesting question that I think will offer some opportunities. I'm not convinced that logistics players will simply just not build their own space as opposed to converting malls, mm -hmm. zone for commercial. There's all sorts of zoning regulations that need to be talked about. However, however, I do think that what you asked is precisely that. That's like as we transition, the net beneficiary you know, of the bane of retail is industrial. That's what's going on here, right? Is it getting too frothy? In industrial, is it too hot? Is it going to overheat? Like, as you look forward, what's the data telling you about not, industrial? Not just yet. Now, you know, to be fair, before COVID, I was hearing some lenders saying we appear to be heading into that space where we're cutting interest rates and getting really, we have to compete so much for this hot sector that it might not be worth it to lend to this sector at this point. But that was before COVID. And now I'm not hearing much of that. Back to you, Bo. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit about multifamily already. Uh, I'm actually seeing that kind of rent growth that you were talking about 
So you are. So this, this small is small town Kentucky. Yeah, Bo. We this, just this had is a sale. This is real, right? I'm like, I know it, this is Moody's data, but you tell me what you're seeing in the trenches. No, rents are going up significantly for multifamily owners, and I'm seeing sales in Nowheresville, Kentucky, where I live, hundred thousand people of like six caps and below on multifamily deals. Incredible, right? We never should see six caps where I live. Like it just, I just don't think the market supports it yet. There it is. So um, I've never seen anything like this in, in multifamily and, and that it actually, it's leaving the primary and secondary markets. And we're starting to see those effects in tertiary markets, like where I live in practice. I, I'd How long say, can that continue? Yeah, I'd say keep watching, right? I think one of the things that folks don't pay much attention to in research right now is simulating, this used to happen at least four or five years ago, right? What kind of, and let's talk about hardcore investing in research. What kind of NOIs would your property need to generate in your investment horizon or hold period to justify your entering level cap rate if cap rates rise by 150 bips. I don't think a lot of people are doing that these days, but put our discussion on research together. If we expect 10-year treasuries to break 3% by the end of 2023, and if there's pressure on cap rates, if Bo doesn't believe six and a half caps are sustainable, then maybe it's fine to enter at six and a half caps, but maybe you need to project what income you need to be earning over your five-year holding period if that six and a half yeah. becomes a seven and a half exit, right? And yeah. I don't think a lot Absolutely. of people are doing that, 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 that simulation slash scenario analysis at this point. The buyers I'm seeing are buying at these cap rates because they believe that they can push rents and continue to push rents. And at some point, they're not going to be able to push rents anymore. Yeah. Like, there's got to be some kind of ceiling on that. But they, you're right. They don't seem to be, well, what if I sell it at an eight cap on the back end? What does that look like? If I bought it at a I, I, half, It used to please. be this. A lot more people used to do it, like right before 2018 and 2019. But you mentioned something very interesting, Bo, when it comes to rent growth not being sustainable, right? Well, maybe it is if you're looking at wage growth being sustainable. But do you see a ton of wage growth right now? It's a really hot job market, so we might see it, right? But how sustainable is that really based on job creation? And so we do go back to the fundamentals in research to go and say, as you assess geographic markets, can people afford what landlords want to charge or what sellers of single family homes want to charge? You know the stories out there right now, Bo, right? In the single, we haven't even talked about single family housing. That's truly on fire. When you've got brokers being paid cash on the side to not list properties, <laughs> because you know the moment you list it, it's going to go above asking by more than that cash payout, then you know there's some kind of froth happening, right? And yet, and yet, we have been underbuilt for quite a bit. I know we took a crash in 08 and 09. There's no evidence of that just yet. And my suspicion is home prices, along with multifamily rents, will continue rising significantly from a relatively low base from 2020, because we did take a hit there, right? Well, since we're talking about housing, we've got a question um, from, from one of our viewers who's asking you to comment on workforce housing. Where are opportunities in workforce housing? I think it's, so if you talk about like tiers of housing and what's offered out there, there is truly demand and a need for workforce, affordable workforce housing, because to your point, Bo, not everyone's going to be able to afford that swanky two bedroom rent in a major urban area, right? So there's definitely demand and need for workforce housing and depending on the vehicle that you end up using to build. I'm, gonna, I'm mixing in manufactured workforce and affordable housing here. I apologize. I'm just looking at the clock and there's just so much more to talk about, right? But here's the point. If you course affordable housing through LIHTC, for example, right? Then, right, as an investor, you might stand to make more in terms of rent growth because you're starting from a HUD capped rent growth level, right? It's affordable. But in terms of rent growth, in terms of being able to increase that, we have evidence that at least 5, 10, 15 LIHTC markets are showing rent growth faster than market rate rentals. 
right? So talk about opportunities yeah. because there is demand for workforce housing as long as you can make the financial structures work. Back to you, Bo. Okay. Uh, another question um, that we have for one of our viewers. They want to know why we didn't see more distressed sales due to COVID. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it's a great question because I remember a journal, a Wall Street Journal article in April or May saying that there were 300 funds waiting to deploy, I'm rounding this out, $297 billion for distressed asset sales. Because, right, that's what happens when there's a recession. You look for deals. And I think what ended up happening was the level of indebtedness and just the level of underwriting stringent, the stringency of underwriting, it never relies. I don't think a lot, this is credit to the bankers, credit to CCIM, credit for maybe lessons learned in 08 and 09. DSC's debt service coverage raisers were at 2.4 before COVID on average, even for retail. LTVs were at 50 to 55%, 20-year lows, right? And so when COVID hit, there wasn't as much of a fixed obligation from the fixed income side. You weren't so heavily indebted that, sure, you know, what if your tenants are not going to pay? It's going to be idiosyncratic blowouts, but it never became systematic. The research statistic is this. Less than 1% of transactions are distressed sales. That is not a crisis in my mind. And I think the reminder here, the rejoinder here is, number one, this was not a real estate-driven crisis. We were not over lending. We were not relaxing underwriting standards, right? This was point. a public yep. health crisis. And so, well, yeah, there were blowouts. Hotels were in trouble. There were some retail properties that really took hits because of tenants going out of business. But in general, distressed sales really didn't become systematic because this wasn't a real estate driven crisis. And we haven't even talked about, right, record government support and the willingness of lenders to go through things like forbearance and work with their borrowers right? Capital never dried up. So those are the things that I think helped us avoid a wide scale, you know, fire sale for commercial properties this time around. Back mm -hmm. to you. Okay. I keep hearing this buzz term ESG. Can you explain to me what this is? And is this, is this going to be, I mean, what's the data tell you about, is, is this mindset to stay? Are we going to start underwriting properties differently or we start what, what can you tell us about what you're seeing there? Now, we certainly think that there is physical risk and climate change and many things that we need to worry about that we never really worried before. I'm going to give credit to the European Union for being a bit ahead of the United States to think through the possible physical risk and impact of climate change on commercial properties, right? That's out there. However, and I'm going to say somewhat something somewhat controversial, right? It is a nuanced conversation, isn't it? Because guess what? If you're a lender with a five-year average maturity for your loans, you really want to start estimating what the climate risk is for a 20 to 30-year projection of when water levels rise. Maybe you don't care. That sounds really callous. You probably don't want to say that in your official documents, but it really depends where you're coming from. And here's another point, right? What about commercial real estate development? Is it really and truly impacted by the risk of wildfire and flooding? Well, there's some weak evidence that yes, for some markets, but for super highly desired, like what about the Miami waterfront? Do you think people care about flooding there? So that they're going to stop building condos? No, when demand is so high for a really attractive location, and number two, there's insurability, right? If there's insurability, mm -hmm then people are going to keep building because those condos are going to get sold out. And so it's a really interesting note. At some point, if you're a lender, if you're an investor, you're going to want, the regulators are going to come down and say, are you truly quantifying the, the risk of climate change and how it's going to impact your property? If there's burnable fuel near, you know, and vegetation near your property, what's the risk of wildfires, Right. You're going to be asked those questions and you're going to have to pay attention to it. However, I think it's going to be a nuanced conversation about the true impact of things like climate risk on development and certainly pricing. Let's talk about pricing, Bo. Like if I have an apartment in New York City on 9th Avenue, right? And the western border of New York City is on 12th Avenue and the Hudson River rises, right? And they're projecting it, they are the river to go all the way up to the 9th Avenue. Like yeah, if my property was on 12th Avenue, I guess there's flood risk. 
but don't I get waterfront property if I'm on Ninth Avenue? Doesn't that increase property value? So it's it's a nuanced it's a nuanced play, right? And I, I think we are simplifying things a bit too much if we blanket and say we make a blanket statement and say, "Ah, oh, it's climate change," and therefore now now there's like a permanent uh, shift in your net operating income of ten percent because of it. I don't think it's that simple. Back to you. Okay. Talk to, talk to us a little bit. We, we had a question about lending. Like, what can we expect? Like, are underwriters going to start changing how they look? What, what are we looking 2022? How could the lending environment change? Well, I'll, I'll and tell you. And then by you, extension, how would, that yeah. in, how would that impact investment in commercial real estate? Yeah, I'll, I'll share what happened in 2020, right? What happened was absolutely lenders did tighten standards if they were lending to new customers, right? Of course they did. They kicked the tires a bit more because of COVID and the crisis. But for existing borrowers, they're far more willing to work with them so that they needn't record defaults and delinquencies. That's what happened in 2020. Our projection, or at least the Mortgage Bankers Association's projections for originations in 2021 is for it to be 31% or more above 2020's levels. To be fair, our record over the last 15 years was to lend over $600 billion to multifamily and commercial real estate. That was in 2019, right before COVID. Okay, Then we took a 26% hit during 2020. But wait, I just said that capital didn't stop flowing, right? Well, yeah, because we were expecting a 60% hit. So 26% was a good thing. And now I'm saying this year, it's going to be a 31% plus increase. And we're going to be back to $578 billion, which was above the 2018 level. There's This is your 6% GDP growth, right? For commercial real estate. It's back in a big way, at least on the lending side and on the investing side, just because of those winning sectors, self-storage, multifamily, logistics that we talked about. Back to you. All right. Well, uh, Victor, I think that about wraps this up. Thank you again for sharing your ex expertise with us today on this webinar. And thank you to everyone who is with us today for your attendance. As a reminder, the recording and accompanying uh, presentation or this video will be emailed to all registered attendees. And if you're not already a CCIM Institute member or course participant, why not? I'd encourage you to take a moment to sign up for our e-newsletter at ccim.com today to stay informed about complimentary webinars like this one, as well as other professional development opportunities. Again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Victor. We appreciate your time and everyone have a great day. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thanks everyone.